All right. Um, today's lecture, or this lecture, is on agroecosystems and the green revolution. Um, <clears throat> and this is, uh, so here's the goals associated with this lecture, the goals and objectives. As I said, I was going to uh, try to make these transparent so you can use these as practice test questions um, to check your knowledge at the end of the lecture, go back, see if you can answer them. Uh, these would be in the accompanying slides that are posted on the course website. Um, and then uh, just a reminder of the framework for the class, we're going through the planetary boundaries. Um, and this is the, we gave a background to planet, planetary boundaries conceptually. And this is the first planetary boundary that we're, uh, we're trying to understand a little bit more in depth, which is our land system change planetary boundary. Um, and so we've talked about anthrones, or anthrones rather is, a, is another uh, topic on this. Um, that uh, you, you either have seen or will see, depending on when you're looking at these slides. Um, and then uh, from here, we're gonna talk about things like freshwater use uh, and be going through biochemical flows and be going through these different planetary boundaries. Um, okay, so I'm gonna begin this boundary with a short um, reference to a discussion of the problem with hunger and the challenge of feeding this growing world population. Um, so uh, the slide, it's a little bit buried here, um, but in South Carolina, there are over, uh, or there are approximately 600,000 um, 600, people experiencing hunger, um, and a huge proportion of those are children. Um, you can click on this embedded slide and it will take you to the website, Feeding America, uh, that will talk a lot if you want to just sort of explore um, and try to understand a little bit more about the hunger problem that we have in America. And um, of course, this hunger problem is even worse in some other areas of the world, right? Um, I saw an estimate, uh, I did not, uh, uh, I saw an estimate the, not very long ago that there were approximately a billion people in the world that face food insecurity. Um, and so this uh, food hunger is a huge challenge in the world. Um, it weakens your immune system. So sometimes people who experience chronic hunger uh, die of other, um, other kind of opportunistic illnesses. It's a terrible phrase, but it's a medical phrase, right? A, a, an illness that um, takes advantage of a weakened immune system. Um, also experiencing hunger can make it difficult to just uh, do any tasks in your life. Um, a huge problem in school systems is children who face hunger. Um, it is not uncommon for children uh, here in the United States where we provide free meals in public schools. It's not uncommon for children to, who are struggling with hunger to have their main meals be in those schools. Um, and then, of course, uh, what happens in their interim time, um, it, you know, when they're not having access to adequate calories can gravely impact their learning experiences and ultimately their um, entire lives. So hunger is a huge challenge. And I begin with this because land system change ultimately is about this issue, right? How do we feed the world? Um, as we go through this lecture, these slides, you're going to see that most of the um, uh, our land system change is land being converted for agriculture. And so the question is ultimately, um, are we doing this in the best way? There are certainly environmental impacts, um, uh, but there's also social impacts associated with the land system changes that we've had. And are we ultimately doing a better job reaching this goal of feeding the world's population? That's not a simple, there's, there's not really a simple one, one, uh, one-sided answer to that. It's quite a complex question to consider, um, and I pose some questions at the end of this lecture um, for you to consider. Okay, so farming a planet. Um, this is, uh, oh, this is, <laughs> this is from the sources posted down there in the corner. Um, this is an approximation of how much of the planet are croplands and pastures, um, which is approximately 40%, let me move these little boxes that are blocking my slides. Um, this one up here, maybe. Uh, approximately 40% of land surface is devoted to agriculture. Um, so that is a large percentage of our planet. Um, you can see the distribution here between pastures and croplands, pastures for grazing animals, um, and of course croplands for crops that we are directly growing. Um, uh, 
a, a, a subtopic of this broader land system change is going to address this issue of efficient use of resources on the planet and the amount of um, resources that go into growing growing animals or cultivating animals um, for you to consider as you kind of think about what this landscape looks like. Oh, suddenly my... Okay, um, this is, uh, I believe this was in a TED talk that I've posted somewhere on the course. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen it yet or not. Um, I'm pretty sure this was uh, John Foley's TED Talk, and it's also in the paper that you read, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is, uh, this is showing you at what agriculture looks like in the landscape in different places in the world, right? And so there's all these, what I, what I like to pull out of this um, is that there are these diverse ways of thinking about, or, or rather of organizing agriculture. So there are diverse ways to grow food, um, uh, and those have varying impacts on the landscape and, and they also have varying possibilities for food production. And so we need to kind of think about all of these things. Um, so this is a place in Minnesota. Here's a place in Kansas where you can really see kind of the different shapes according to um, the different irrigation patterns. Uh, here's Germany where you have these little tiny lots that are um, you know, carved out for different purposes. Here's Bolivia. Um, so you can see here what looks like maybe some buffers um, and then these kind of um, different cropscapes that are radiating out from a center. Um, in Thailand, we're probably looking here at some terraced agriculture. That's my, um, again, looking at these different uh, kind of, um, it looks like thin terraces, but without the, um, it's a little bit difficult to see there, but they're definitely small, thin strips. Um, and then, and it looks like, maybe a road in there. Um, and then here in Brazil, where we're looking at something a little bit more kind of like the Midwestern look, right? Where you have um, these big, um, uh, I'm gonna go, go so far as to say efficient um, irrigated plots of land that are probably producing large amounts of crops. And then this definitely was in the Folly article, um, which is this um, posture or pondering. Um, so this is what I would call a conceptual figure. Um, and this is a conceptual figure that helps us to understand uh, what are the different ways that um, ecosystem services um, can be produced on the land, right? So if we think about an ecosystem, uh, they're per an ecosystem is doing its regular functions and it's producing things that are good for human existence that helps us survive, right? And so here a natural ecosystem is going to have a role in infectious disease mediation, this, um, an infectious disease mediation by providing buffers and actually separations between animals and humans to prevent some of those zoonotic diseases that we all now know a little bit too closely. Um, there's gonna be climate and air quality regulation, uh, carbon sequestration, water quality regulation. There's big filtration that can happen in natural ecosystems um, and things like that. But they're not gonna produce a lot of food, right? There's gonna be food produced for all living organisms and not just humans, which means that we'll be able to, I mean, those who are in the know, which is a knowledge that is increasingly being lost by humans, um, would know how to hunt and forage for some food in these, but not the size of population that we have on the planet today. Um, moving over to this other extreme, we have an intensive cropland where you have a maximization of crop production, but then all of these other um, uh, all of these other ecosystem services are really kind of minimized, and in fact, sometimes we're damaging them. Uh, we're causing more damage to things like water quality um, at the same time that we take away the ecosystem service of water quality regulation. Um, and then we have this kind of idealized, um, what uh, Foley's referring to as this terraculture, this, um, could we have a cropland with restored ecosystem services so that people are able to maybe not produce as much crops as they're producing here, but could we produce enough to feed the planet while also getting these other ecosystem services that we care about? Um, and this is something that I, uh, a lot of my personal research and work as an academic um, falls in sort of trying to understand what these systems look like 
and how we can better support them from a policy perspective, but also just from, um, from consumers to uh, producers kind of perspective of how can we um, get more of these types of croplands and systems uh, that I would argue have benefits for our environment, but they also have social benefits um, and benefits, uh, like cultural benefits um, to people. Okay, so this is what we're gonna really look at for the rest of this lecture, because we're talking about the Green Revolution, and the Green Revolution is really what produced this intensive cropland um, to the extent that we now know it today. So what was the Green Revolution? Um, the Green Revolution was a series of uh, scientific advancements. Again, um, though there have been many negative consequences of this revolution, I like to always post that very positive video of the Green Revolution to give you that perspective as well, um, which is because this lecture is going to focus on some of the negatives. Um, but we posted the video to give you this counterpoint that the Green Revolution um, it particularly initially was entirely about how do we feed the maximum number of people on the planet. Um, and it began with some advances. Um, and so we're gonna go through a couple of these here, but just to kind of give you an overview, um, it was about the mechanization and standardization of agriculture. So more machinery and more um, sort of a scientific approach to growing food. Cheap fossil fuel, we're gonna get to this in a slide here, but um, the fossil fuel industry has essentially subsidized um, the Green Revolution in the sense that um, we are using fossil fuel calories in terms of energy burned to grow our food. Um, and that is not a sustainable situation, that there's sort of an end to point to how much we can produce that way. So that is um, something for us to think about um, as we move forward. Uh, large farms. So in the United States, not long after the Green Revolution, we started seeing what we would call the death of the small family farm. Um, and as the Green Revolution has moved into more and more countries, um, we see the same pattern happening there. Um, it's not only the Green Revolution, there's other factors that have impacted this, um, but it is one of the factors that is, have impacted farm size. Um, monocropping, growing one crop as opposed to diversified crops. So if I showed you my little backyard garden in about a, uh, it's about a 20 by 20, um, so what's 400 square feet um, plot, uh, I am growing, I don't know, seven different vegetables, right? Well, a monocropping system would have, um, you know, anywhere from a hundred to a thousand acres of the same uh, crop being grown. Um, so intensification, that means putting large inputs into the agriculture um, to produce more, a higher yield of uh, food. So particularly with intensification, we're talking about water and uh, fertilizer inputs. So we have fertilizers, pesticides as well, irrigation um, falling under that intensification category. Um, and then uh, high yield varieties of seeds themselves, um, sometimes um, genetically modified, but sometimes just seeds that have been bred for higher yield. So we tend to kind of confuse these two concepts in the general public. A genetically modified organism is something that has had its genes directly, the genetic code has been directly um, modified through uh, genetic technology to insert a gene of in interest, um, let's say uh, examples, there's the famous example of the corn that had a sort of built-in pesticide, um, that would be genetic modification. Whereas, um, or was it built-in pesticide resistance? I can't remember. Um, uh, whereas in the case of um, other ways that we've bred these varieties is just through, throughout the centuries, farmers have always been selecting for um, better species of plants that give them better um, uh, yields, better results, right? So that's kind of just the natural, farmers have naturally selected for certain varieties of plants. Um, and now there's kind of a more scientific approach to that um, that would also count in this. But that's, that is different from genetically modified organisms. Um, I think sometimes people confuse them um, not everything produced, for example, by Monsanto is going to be a genetically modified organism. Some might be these higher yield varieties, um, et cetera. Okay, so 
Uh, Neocaloric revolution, I like to show this because this, this slide really gets at the issue I was talking about of subsidizing agriculture. So the energy subsidy, typically through the fossil fuel industry, um, and that's, that's including the fossil fuels that are in fertilizer, the fossil fuels that are being used to um, produce fertilizer, the fossil fuels that are being used to run the machinery on, um, on farms and showing up there in fishing as well. So if you look, um, the typical U.S. diet is about 10 calories of fossil fuel for every calorie that we consume. Okay, so just to remind you, a calorie is um, the amount of heat it takes to uh, increase one milliliter of water, one degree Celsius. I hope I have that right. Um, and uh, so um, a calorie is just a unit of energy. Um, and so when we talk about calories in food, it's how much energy that, uh, that food would give us. Um, and then the energy, of course, we need to be able to do the functions of our body, um, including producing the heat for our bodies because we are um, endotherms. And so um, we can also talk about other sorts of energy in terms of calories, right? So 10 calories of fossil fuel to produce one calorie of food. Um, I hope that uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of fancy math to see that that's an unsustainable system, right? We are pulling energy out of deep underground wells in order to not actually eat it. We convert it to a food that we can't eat. Um, but uh, ultimately, that's we're putting more energy in than we're getting out. Um, so that would not be uh, considered sustainable long term. Um, Okay, so and comparing that to how humans, you know, uh, would have been gathering food for um, uh, hundreds of thousands of years prior to the invent of ag agriculture, right, which was hunting and gathering, and it took about 0.1 calories of our energy to get a calorie of food. So hence, it made sense to hunt and gather because ultimately we had more energy to survive um, than we were expending hunting, right? Um, and then if you look at sort of small scale farming, um, which is, this is the area that we moved into, um, and then this is where we're at today that has been made possible by this green revolution. Okay, so what is this green revolution? So beginning around the 1940s, um, the, the scientists, uh, some sci scientists in Germany um, were uh, able to figure out how to create fertilizer. Um, by uh, sequestering nitrogen. Nitrogen is naturally found in the atmosphere. Um, it is a gas in a diatomic nitrogen state, which is N2. And so it makes up about 70% of our atmosphere, but there's a limited amount that is fixed in the ground um, and it's fixed slowly um, through the process of soil regeneration. Um, and we're gonna talk about this when we get to the nitrogen cycle in more details next week. But a scientist figured out how to, um, a scientist Haber and Bosch figured out how to pull this nitrogen out of the atmosphere and fix it into a solid compound that could then be used in fertilizer. And that was sort of the start of the Green Revolution. Um, that process, um, along with the mining of phosphate rock, allowed us to create fertilizer that could then be shipped around the globe and put onto plants which is why you could have terrible red clay fertilizer or soil in your backyard um, and put some miracle grow on plants and still get them to grow. Um, because miracle grow is essentially your nit uh, nitrogen and phosphorus um, and usually a few other compounds like potassium um, or rather elements um, that are inside of that uh, that are inside of that fertilizer. So what is it that we've seen, this trend? You read this in the Tillman article, um, that the trend over the last uh, you know, 50, well, this ends at two, uh, 2000, but the trend has continued on into the present, which is this growth in the inputs in our agriculture, right? So nitrogen, um, nitrogen and phosphorus in, uh, in, in, uh, over on this axis and the primary X or primary Y axis, um, we're seeing this growth in nitrogen inputs and we're seeing this growth in phosphorus inputs. Why more nitrogen and phosphorus? Just because of the um, ratio that you need for plant production. And then you're also seeing a similar growth in irrigation, which is measured over on this axis. And so again, this is over a 40 year period from 1960 to 2000. 
as you go through these figures, hopefully you um, can recognize there's a similar trend happening. Um, here is growth in pasture land and growth in cropland, and you see both are following the same trajectory. Um, and here is uh, growth in uh, global pesticide production. Again, um, per this would be your million tons. Um, and uh, finally, your growth in pesticide imports, right? So what we're seeing ultimately, if you just had the kind of one sentence to say about these figures, it's a growth in the intensification of agriculture and the inputs um, uh, in agriculture that are happening um, in order to feed the planet, right? Produce the amount of food that we're producing for um, seven and a half billion people on the planet. This is what our standard bag of fertilizer looks like. So remember I mentioned that there's a higher nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, which is um, you know, going back to what we see here about the differences um, in the amount produced. Uh, and potassium. Um, so any fertilizer that you get is gonna have um, a combination of these different elements. Um, and uh, Nitrogen and phosphorus in particular, you might recognize as key, if you've taken any bio courses, as key elements of um, DNA and proteins. Okay, so great, all these fabulous things um, that happen with the technologies involved in uh, the Green Revolution, but now we're going to get to some of the problems associated with it. Um, and so what I pointed out um, in the beginning of this is that the Green Revolution has the best of intentions, right? Trying to feed the planet. However, um, anytime you create an unsustainable system, you're bound to create some problems associated with that. Um, and perhaps if there's one take home from um, sustainability science, environmental sciences, uh, it would be that, right? Um, you, uh, an unsustainable system can only persist for so long before you run into some pretty serious uh, consequences. And um, as time marches on, those consequences are becoming more and more um, overbearing and apparent to us. So um, problem one is eutrophication. Um, so this nitrogen and phosphorus does not stay um, in one place. Uh, we tend to actually over fertilize in um, our, our crops. And as a consequence of that, often it is running off into nearby bodies of water. And so when those, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus gets to these coastal areas, um, it can cause these algal, algal, as in algae, algal blooms, because algae are also um, nitrogen loving organisms. And so they will suck up all that nitrogen and grow really, really quickly. Um, and then they will run out of nitrogen and die. And when they die, their decomposition process will suck the oxygen out of the body of water, which means that all of the organisms that need oxygen in order to live, such as fish, uh, will not be able to live. And you create hypoxic or low oxygen zones or even dead zones in these areas. So that is the process of eutrophication. And again, that's caused by over fertilization um, and, that, and that fertilizer running off so a lot of this zone was created in, through the Great Plains, you know, heading into the Mississippi and out through the Mississippi Delta and creating this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we get a lot of fertilizer running off into this zone here as well. Um, I switched here to this little um, uh, hand indicator that shows you that if you click on this, it will open up a website where you can explore this a little bit more. Okay, here is an image of uh, eutrophication, or this is actually the algal bloom. Um, so this is what an algal bloom looks like. And now that you see the picture, I'm hoping you're like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Um, and you can see it in the Furman Lake at times. Um, however, uh, they actually spray the um, pesticides periodically into the Furman Lake to keep these algal blooms down. Otherwise we'd have a lot more. Um, so algal blooms, this is uh, the, moving towards the process of eutrophication. Um, problem number two, soil degradation. So um, because we are not sustainably regenerating the soils um, and instead we are, we are relying on inputs such as fertilizer um, and pesticides, right, to 
uh, sort of artificially regenerate soils that are degraded, what we've created is sort of a runaway train of increasingly degraded soils. Um, and there are a lot of environmental scientists working on this issue, believing that we're, this is one of the biggest potential threats to agriculture in the future, is the fact that we are, um, we just have extremely degraded soils across the planet. Um, there are ways to improve soil quality, um, but those are time consuming um, and they can be, uh, I mean, it's mostly that they're time consuming and that they can be expensive to do on a large scale. Um, a lot of the things that the organic agriculture movement does, however, is try to um, uh, use, by using organic fertilizers, you're more likely to contribute to soil regeneration because a lot of those organic sources um, come from plants and manure. Irrigation um, is another source of soil degradation. Uh, you can end up with a problem called salination of soil, which is basically that when you water your soil, you, uh, your water is composed of um, salts and minerals along with the actual H2O molecules. And if you're watering on a hot day, that water goes ahead and evaporates um, and the salts get left on the surface and you can um, create a uh, salty soil. And this is a process called salination. Okay, and we're gonna get, a lot, get to this um, in the future uh, when we talk about freshwater use. But this is, um, uh, for, most of our fresh water is being used for agriculture and industry. Um, and so looking at the issue of agriculture here, here's a, just an image of the Colorado River from the 1950s and today. Um, if you're not aware, the Colorado River runs through kind of the central western states. Um, and uh, right now actually does not, it, it runs dry before it each reaches the sea. Um, because so much water is extracted for agriculture along the way. Um, here is a picture of the Aral Sea. Um, I believe this was in one of the TED Talks, um, talking about how this is what it looked like in 1989. This is, uh, today it's actually pretty much dried up. And um, again, due to freshwater uh, over extraction to uh, irrigate surrounding areas. Um, there's also an interesting issue here, which will come up um, in, in some case studies we're going to look at in this class, which is that the Aral Sea was used as a dumping ground for toxic pollution. And now that sediment at the bottom of the Aral Sea, now that it is no longer diluted through this water, is just sort of sitting there, uh, this, this toxic sediment. And we have a potential issue like this um, near to home with some of the mill sediment left uh, or the, the waste left by the now abandoned mill, mills. Okay, so another issue are insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Um, first of all, these uh, create potential human health problems. And again, um, as, if you've ever tried to garden, um, in fact, the next slide I think is gonna show one of the most annoying pests I've been dealing with on my potato plants recently. But if you ever tried to garden, you will get pests. Um, and monoculture invites a large concentration of pests because you're basically putting a certain types of pests, favorite food in one area and you're making the area relatively un uninhabitable for other organisms. So natural um, uh, things that might uh, eat those pests or destroy those pests are not really encouraged to be in the monoculture environment. Um, so you tend to get worse pests. And so um, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides are great solutions to some of these pests, but at the same time, they're potential, um, they can potentially be harmful to human health. Um, we, it, it, in my experience in the United States, it seems that we do a fairly good job of eliminating the unhealthy ones from our market. Um, I have seen in other places where they're not eliminated. Um, I know that, for example, um, pineapple, uh, pineapple grown in the tropics is a very intensive um, pesticide, uh, uh, use a lot of pesticides to produce the pineapple and it's caused a lot of human rights violations among workers. Um, so pesticides can be a big problem for human health. They're a problem for another reason, which is that you kind of create this runaway cycle 
of um, pesticide resistance, which means that you apply, apply pesticides, right? Um, so we'll start here in this cycle. You apply the pesticide. This is a potato bug larva. <laughs> you, uh, I don't know the scientific name of this bug, but uh, we call it a potato bug. Um, and so it's, you, you apply the pesticide, some die, but some survive. Um, the ones who survive are actually resistant to that pesticide. So they grow, they reproduce, and now when you apply that same pesticide, you're not gonna get the same kind of results. So what do you need to do? This is the entire industry of um, some big ag com companies, agrochemical companies, they come up with stronger pesticides, right? We have the same issue with our, um, our antibiotic resistance. It's a similar concept, right? Um, it's why they say take all your antibiotics so you don't leave these little guys sitting behind to reproduce and become resistant. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, we are basically, we run out of pesticides that we can use. We have to create stronger pesticides. And in this case, stronger pesticides run a greater risk of um, hurting humans. And so this is a huge challenge of um, agriculture. And a third problem with pesticides is biomagnification. Um, uh, the slide of DDT is your kind of classic example from, um, if you're familiar with the start of the environmental movement, um, a book written by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. Um, this is, I should say, the start of the modern United States environmental movement um, uh, of how we kind of think and know of it today. Um, but uh, they were discovering that these large predatory birds were dying. Um, one of them that was particularly at risk was the bald eagle, so our um, national symbol. And uh, the reason this was happening is because DDT, which is a great pesticide, um, in many ways DDT is thought to be responsible for the elimination of malaria from a lot of our southern states and um, Florida, well Florida is also a southern state, um, and uh, however it's extremely toxic and what was happening is it was magnifying right up the food chain so it was in the water and then the zooplankton would have a higher concentration they would never process and eliminate it from their bodies these minnows would eat the zooplankton, more would get um, concentrated in their body, and then you would end up with these birds that were eating the needlefish, or just, sorry, that's just an example, but any fish, um, they were eating these fish that um, then they would end up with these large amounts of this pesticide in their body. Um, DDT seems like a long time ago. It is one of the reasons that we eliminated DDT use in this country. Um, However, uh, a more recent example would be mercury poisoning. Um, so nowadays, uh, typically we are advised to not eat fish too frequently because there are so many fish, um, particularly ocean fish, that are bioaccumulating bio mercury in their bodies and humans eating mercury too much can run the risk of mercury poisoning. Um, so these kinds of things, uh, we actually do see a lot in our food chain. Um, uh, nowadays, which is again this bioaccumulation, um, now impacting foods, particularly if you're eating meats because you're you're eating higher up on the food chain. Okay, socioeconomic impacts. Um, this is just a uh, slide to show you how farm size has changed since 1950. Um, and granted, this is done by 1992, so this is also outdated. Um, but we know this trend has continued, right? That you had in 1950, a lot of these smaller, so these smaller under 59 acre farms. Um, now, uh, in 1992, there's very few, oh, now, wow, I'm back in time. Sorry, in 1992, there were many fewer of these smaller farms. And um, uh, ultimately, right, you're, you're ending up with, um, more farms that are going to be actually even over a uh, thousand acres, right? So you're moving in this direction of larger and larger farms. Um, as we know, we've lost a lot of the small farms. They cannot compete in the current landscape of agriculture. Um, the subsidies sort of accumulate that, that our government offers accumulate in the hands of larger farms. Um, often these subsidies are per acre, per crop, so they, they would accumulate in larger landowners. Um, and so the small farm becomes less and less viable. Um, and as remembering back to that terraculture slide, um, and if you've ever been involved in a local food movement, there are a lot of benefits 
um, both ecological and social to producing food and sharing food um, that have been lost through this process. Okay, so some things to think about. I've got, oh, just kidding. So I've got four questions here. Um, I posted these also, I believe, on a little, um, uh, on a little prompt. And I would like you to, uh, you know, think about um, one or two of these questions, I, whatever the prompt says, and um, submit your uh, responses to the discussion. All right. See you next time.